Welcome to Robotics and Automation News Webinars, where you can be part of a global event without leaving your home or office. Attend our live webinars and communicate directly with influential professionals in your industry. I'm here with Abdul Montakim, editor of Robotics and Automation News, Steve Benuti, VP of Marketing, and Roger Isaac, CTO of Kisa. Kisa has reinvented the connector with its KISS connectivity solution based on a proprietary solid state connector that uses extremely high frequencies to provide low power, high speed data transfer securely and simply. Kisa has also recently launched its VPIO or virtual pipe IO technology architecture, which enables IO to scale with processor and memory performance. This allows product designers to develop new classes of products. I'm going to turn the presentation now over to the folks at Kisa. Steve? Thank you, Kimberly. This is Steve Venuti, uh, VP Marketing of Kisa, and it's my uh, pleasure to walk you through some of Kisa's core technology so that you can understand how it might have an impact on your business and uh, what you do. We talk about I.O. and revolutionizing I.O. from the source to the destination. I.O. may be, it may seem like a very uh, boring subject, but it is an fundamental to any computing system, and it is the focus of Kisa. First, just some factual information about Kisa so you get some idea about our beginnings. We were founded in 2009. We've really spent the, almost the entire time in R&D with over 250 patents uh, that have been filed, um, half of which have been issued, on this concept of a solid state connector, and we'll go into that later. We're headquartered here in California, Silicon Valley, uh, but we do have offices in Portland, Oregon, where a lot of our RF engineers are. As well, we have offices overseas uh, to meet the needs of our customers in both China, Taiwan, and in Korea. We're about 50 employees, and we are backed primarily by strategic investment partners, including Samsung, FIT, which is Foxconn Interconnect Technology, the connector company of Foxconn, Foxconn Hanhai, the mother company, Intel, Hynix, and Dolby. So let me give you some idea of our of land, the landscape and how we look at uh, our, our, our mission of our company. If we really simplify the world of computing, we really think of three fundamental, fundamental pillars, ap application processing, the processor, memory, and then I.O. Without any of these working, a computing system cannot function. And Kisa is solely focused on looking at how we can improve and advance I.O. and how we can bring advanced technology for I.O. It is our fundamental belief that processing and memory have long ago gone solid state and the performance actually is at a pace that is, is, is consistent with Moore's law. But I.O., because it is a mechanical construct uh, and because it requires metal touching metal, whether it's a pogo pin or a B2B connector and a flex cable or a external connector, it cannot have that kind of scale. So we need to look at advanced technologies to bring I.O. up to the level of performance of these other fundamental pillars of, of uh, computing. When we started the company and we spent most of our time on this concept of a mechanical connector and how we can improve the mechanical connector. So there are three samples down there below on the bottom of the screen there. One's, of course, a USB connector. It could be an HDMI connector, a SATA connector, any external connector. And they have their issues. They have, certainly have their function, but they have their issues. The other one in the middle there is, of course, a B2B connector over a flex cable, which connects boards together in many devices. And then there's the pogo pin, which has been around forever, uh, as a fundamental way of ensuring that there's connectivity between one board to another, one chip to a board or, in fact, uh, one system to another. And that's where we focused our, our, our first eight years to come up with what we call a solid state connector. Why the connector needs to be invented. We fundamentally believe that the connector has not changed in decades. It is still what we call an industrial era technology, metal touching metal. And that has not kept pace with product design and manufacturing. 
There are five basic reasons we give here why the connector needs to be reinvented. And everyone has a different, uh, a different challenge when they, when they have to design kind of IO and connectivity between devices. One is signal interference. Signals are getting faster and faster. There's many more sensors, uh, cameras, and, and as well, just the, the, the resolution of uh, video and the size of data. Uh, there, there are more and more and higher and higher speeds going over these, these lines. And that begins to have an impact on other signals that are out there, including Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, or in fact, just any other signals that are radiated. The connector and metal generally is a wonderful conductor of electrons, of course, we know that. But that also makes it a wonderful radiator of energy. This becomes extremely difficult when the speeds go higher and higher, and there's shielding and, and, and co-location issues that you can deal with this, but it becomes a bigger and bigger problem. The second is industrial design. This is really a, an industrial designer's or a product designer's nightmare because, uh, because they want to design the sleekest and most beautiful products. And, uh, and many times the connector requires a certain footprint, requires a certain location, and this can have an impact on industrial design. Number three is the one I think everyone understands and everyone knows intuitively, and that is connectors, because they are a mechanical construct, they're prone to wear and tear, they're subject to everyday hazards, water, dust, lint, moisture, vibration, heat, all of these things can have an impact on that fragile connection of metal touching metal. And that, that then makes uh, products unreliable uh, and, and, and provide difficulty for, for systems. Number four is an interesting one. It's, it's, it's that connectors have a certain requirement for footprint. And I'll give an example so you can imagine how this might be implemented. If you imagine the, the fastest server in the world, a data center server, it has a lot of I.O. out the back, maybe 8, maybe 12, maybe even 16 ports. It could go 40 gigabits per second, 100 gigabits per second, moving faster. But even so, with such massive bandwidth out the back, it is limited by the physical nature of the ports out the back and that physical number. And the processing capabilities of that server are actually greater than the I.O. So what we, what we talk about is how the bandwidth density is limited when you are limited by this physical connector and how our solution could break that open because we're not, we're not subject to have to be on any one particular piece of the device. We could be anywhere, and we'll show you examples of that. The last one is very important to manufacturing. And that is that uh, if you think about automated manufacturing and the latest in manufacturing a lot of products, I think about a consumer electronics products because this came out of a company that, that, that manufactures consumer electronics products. And they let us know that the entire process was automated except for one part where they still have someone on the line who needs to connect and assemble the, and connect the B2B connector from the let's use a smartphone as an example, a camera module to the main board, the display to the main board, that is a person taking a B2B connector, inserting it in one and inserting it in the other, make sure it's connected. That is a reliability issue. It's certainly a cost issue. It's an, it's an operational time issue. Uh, and in fact, with our technology, you could SMT our product onto one board, onto another, bring those together in the manufacturing process in an automated way, and you would have a high-speed connection. So I'll let Roger talk about our technology and exactly what it is and, uh, and the, the features and capabilities of it. Hi, so um, a little bit about our technology here. Uh, we are a uh, small, very, very tiny three by three uh, chip. We transmit at 60 gigahertz and we transmit up to six gigabit per second. So it's extremely fast uh, data transmission. We go over very short distances here, so we're not talking about across the room. We're talking about going from device A to device B over a very short distance of less than one centimeter. Uh, we're very power friendly, so our power is about 12.5 picojoules per bit, which is on the same order of magnitude as what you would have for a wired connection. So we're very, very, very efficient from a power perspective. We have very low latency. So the latency from the input to our transmitter to the output of our receiver is 500 picoseconds. That gives you performance just like a wire in terms of latency. 
Uh, we also have a bit error rate of less than 10 to the minus 12. So we have wired performance uh, for a very short distance for wireless. And we also, one of the things that's very important is we're a point to point connection. So we're not trying to uh, create a network of devices. We're creating a, a single connection for each uh, connector that we have. And this creates a very, very, very short distance point to point connection uh, and private connection. So it's not shared amongst m uh, multiple devices. Uh, the other aspect here that's very important from our technology perspective is that we require no software or drivers. So when you use our technology to replace uh, a standard such as USB, DisplayPort, SATA, PCI Express, low speed, we can replace it on a hardware level with no software, no drivers, just by putting our uh, chip into the system and connecting our uh, chip just like you would a connector and we're able to communicate over uh, a very short distance doing that. Also, it provide, our, our technology provides instantaneous connect. There's no pairing, no login. So from a user perspective, it acts and feels just like a traditional connector, but without the connector. So we're uh, a, a very high speed, six gigabit per second connector without the metal. And I'll just add the, um, there's a note there, three by three millimeter. The antenna is on board. So this is an entire, call it a module. It's got everything you need. Uh, and you just place it near the edge of a device, place another uh, on another edge of a device and bring those devices together and you have a connection. Now this sounds, I imagine, uh, a little strange. So I think the best way to provide a, a good view of the technology is to give some examples and I've got some videos here so you can see how this technology works. Uh, let me just tell you what we have here. We have a couple of boxes up here. All they have is one chip on each side and batteries on a small evaluation board and batteries. So this is just a transmitter and a receiver and we're going to bring those together to show you kind of the distance and how this behaves, how our product behaves. But as Roger also said, we operate in the 60 gigahertz spectrum, portion of the spectrum, which means this is millimeter wave technology. And our technology has been designed in such a way that these waves can be propagated and transported over simple plastic. And I'll show you some examples of that, how we can do certain things with a 3D printed lens. There's nothing special here, just a piece of plastic, and it's very cheap plastic, everyday plastic. And as well, how we can transport the same six gigabits per second signal over a plastic cable. And I show that because it opens designers' eyes into how they can rethink of the way they may connect devices. Uh, and there are implementations that use this plastic in this specific way, as well as different ways to get around traditional problems related to connecting devices that may be moving in strange ways. So the first video I'll play is very simple, two devices coming together so you can understand there's a, gr there's a green light up there. We bring them apart and the green light goes off. It's not connected. They're again connected and disconnected and they will connect. Now you'll probably ask how far is the distance? The distance is about one centimeter. Uh, the alignment requirements is about plus or minus 1.5 millimeters. So it has much looser tolerance requirements than a pogo pin or a physical connector, um, but it does need to be aligned uh, within what plus or minus 1.5 millimeter and a Z distance of about one centimeter chip to chip. Now, as I mentioned, if we put some of these lenses on the top, you see how the distance was about well, maybe one or two centimeters. If we put these lenses on the top in front of our chip, these lenses are now going to focus that signal. And then all of a sudden, you can see here the green light is going. Now we have a distance of about one foot. So there's an example of how without any electronics, without any active components, we're really using plastic to focus the signal, go a farther distance. There's no degradation of speed. There's no, there's no increase of power. It's just really using plastic uh, as, a tr as, a way, as a way of transporting and, and reworking the waves so that it has more focus. And more importantly, I think, for as many implementations is this next video, which includes putting a couple of uh, plastic just holders in front of the chip. And then we'll take this very cheap piece of plastic, 
cut with scissors. There's no real, uh, real tolerance and line, alignment, uh, tight alignment requirements. And we'll connect this together. And now you can see the green lights on down there. And essentially, we now have a six gigabit per second transport cable, plastic cable, over very cheap plastic that can bend and be flexed in many different ways. It's much more lighter weight, obviously, than metal. It will bend and flex uh, much better than metal. And it's also very much cheaper. So there's some very interesting properties of the technology that you will see in some of the designs that people are working on. So let me show you some of the how how that technology then gets translated into meeting the needs of some of our customers. So I'll show you how plastic can kind of help us in certain ways. But first, let me show you some very basic things about our technology. And I know we're talking about robotics and automation here, but I just give you this as an example of a use case of using Kisa as purely a connector to one device to another. This is a video wall. This is a video wall, and the video walls, as you know, are being, really being re-architected, and they're now being made of these small LED panels that are then placed onto a larger frame. And in the case of a video wall, you can imagine all the cables that are used for control and for video that are in the back of a video wall. But with Kisa, this is just out of our lab, one of these panels can just snap off, and we have behind the plastic there one of our devices, and in the back of the panel one of our devices, and you snap it back in, and you have a, in this case, three gigabit per second video connection. So there's an example of bringing one product to another, establishing a connection at a very high speed, and minimizing all of the cables and the repair and installation required in this case for a video wall. Now, of course, one of the great things about our technology is that it can be embedded inside of plastic. It is embedded inside of products. And I show you this video, just a sample video, to show you a natural use case. We have a storage card with our device inside of water here and a reader here that is connected to a PC. And as you can see here, the reader just saw the SSD inside of that water and is now going to, we're going to play a movie from that device so it's reading through water. Now I show you this mainly to show you what I think uh, a lot of our customers look for, and that is the fact that this can be ruggedized. You can finally have a connector that can be completely waterproof. It can be dustproof. There's no mechanical pieces to it. Uh, and so you can think about factory floors and think about harsh environments, automobiles, uh, think about um, hospitals where ruggedization and, uh, and, and lack of exposure of the pins and traces of a connector are very, very important and where reliability is critical. Now, using you, you saw how we used plastic to do very unusual things about transferring in the way we transport signals. I'll let Roger talk about how we've it used, used that innovation to overcome some fundamental issues with, uh, with getting with metal as a way of, uh, of transporting high-speed signals and low-speed signals through complicated fixtures. Hi, so um, when we uh, look at uh, the picture on the lower left-hand side here, uh, we have created a way to transmit RRF signals through a circular rotating uh, waveguide, similar to, to what you see up there in the uh, upper left-hand corner. And this allows us to address different types of problems in rotational types of uh, connections. Um, if I play the middle uh, one on the bottom here, you can actually see uh, the waveguide there. And when we plug it in, you actually see this is running at 5.4 gigabit per second uh, between a desktop and the monitor. And we can rotate that uh, 360 degrees and provide uh, full 5.4 gigabit per second uh, transfer da uh, data rates without having a physical connection. So it's just a small uh, waveguide there that we allow for our technology really uh, to com communicate across 360 degrees. On the right hand side here, we have a laptop. And this laptop we've modified, and we've modified by uh, taking out the traditional hinge. The traditional hinge element has many, 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 many wires going through it that are communicating between 
the laptop and the monitor. And we have replaced that with our new technology, our plastic uh, that we've developed uh, and our RF technology to allow for complete rotation across that hinge, that very complicated mechanical hinge in a very simple fashion with very, very simple plastics. Okay, uh, on the bottom here, we have a couple of other applications of our technology that are extremely unique for our technology itself. So this disc here is for an 8K TV. Uh, the 8K TV is transmitting 96 gigabit per second uh, of data between a base and the TV. And the manufacturer of this TV has removed all of the electronics from the TV and move them to the base to create a very thin, elegant, beautiful design for the panel. And by removing everything to the base, they can have a very light panel, very thin panel, and easy to install panel. But when you remove all the electronics from the panel, you still need to connect to that panel. And the manufacturer here is using KISA, uh, 32 KISA in fact, uh, to communicate between the base and the panel. The interesting thing about our technology is that we scale with the number of devices unlike any other wireless connection out there. So with one device, we can communicate up to six gig, two devices, 12 gig, three devices, 18 gig, and so on and so forth. In this case, the manufacturer used 32 of our devices, each running at three gigabit per second for a total of 96 gigabit per second. On the lower right-hand side, you also see another application, which is a Kisa tile. We have a server storage application that is running at 640 gigabit per second, which is an incredible uh, amount of bandwidth uh, through wireless technology. And we do this by using 128 KISA devices, uh, each running in parallel, each running at five gigabit per second, and each maintaining a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 12, completely unheard of in, in any other wireless connection out there. So we can scale in many different fashions. In fact, we have applications that go down to you know, one megabit or uh, two megabit uh, type of data rates, all the way up to 640 gigabit per second. And going forward, that uh, server storage application will be scaling to 1.2 terabit per second con uh, wireless connectivity. So thank you, Roger. I wanted to show you how the technology can be used as a prelude to some of the applications that we see in automation, in automotive, in robotics, and in on industrial floor uh, factory automation. The markets that we serve are many because as any connector, it's a horizontal technology that can apply to any device that needs to communicate with another device. So we have mobile and gaming applications, we have display applications, not only video wall, but TV applications, data center applications, but for the purpose of this presentation and this audience, we're going to focus on robotics, automotive, and industrial factory automation, uh, because I think you'll find that more, uh, more important and, and pertinent to your jobs. So let's look at robotics and where we see the opportunities for our technology and where it's being used, although we cannot give customer names because most of these products will be launching in the next year, 2019, uh, we can give you some examples of the use cases. So one of, the key, one of the key issues in robotics is that there is more and more, there are more and more sensors and cameras at the edge that are defining how the robots work and are, are, are monitoring and sensing the, uh, the world around it. That requires more data uh, coming through the joints and these joints are becoming much more articulated. It's no longer just a binary uh, up, down, left, right, uh, but they, they are becoming much more articulated and those present challenges to traditional connectivity. Anytime you twist and turn and rotate, and especially over time, there is a lot of wear and tear on metal, and metal can be very fragile and can, and can break. And there is a, more and more of a requirement for rotational freedom and independent motion of these joints. And as these sensors and, and cameras and edge sensors get more and more deployed, uh, they require increased connectivity, and there's also other kinds of sensing that happens with these things, including pressure sensitivity or heat sensitivity to understand uh, and react in, in real time. 
one of the things we've done is taken that technology that we sh showed you in high speed and use and, 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 and developed it for a low speed application, really machine to machine application for bi-directional multi protocol 360 degree connector for machine to machine communication on a factory floor. Uh, I cannot tell you the exact use case, but this was developed for a major manufacturer of uh, automated manufacturing equipment and robots. But the, in this case, what we're doing is aggregating many low speed signals. These are just some of the low speed signals that you can, you can uh, aggregate over a single device so that we have one lane of KISA communicating with another lane of KISA at low speed, even in, in full aggregation, we're talking fairly low speed. And uh, de-aggregating on the other side. And because it's low speed, we can turn the, the signal around and this becomes bi-directional. And I'll show you an example of this, this uh, development kit that we give. And you can see the light on the, uh, the blue light at the bottom means the signal is going. So there we have inputs on the bottom down here, many different inputs and different IOs coming in here, low speed protocols, aggregated over, over a single line through the KISA um, circular the column, connector. the rotational connector, and, uh, and then communicated to the other side. One of the use cases that we have that will be coming out in 2019 is in robotic surgery devices. There are many connector concerns there, which are some are specific to the, uh, the hospital environment and the operating room environment, and some are broadly associated with connectors in any sort of non-consumer application. Specifically in a hospital, sterilization is critical. And currently you can imagine um, a video cap camera in going inside of a, a body during surgery and the connector uh, required for that going to the, the, con the robotic console. Uh, the connectors need to be high speed uh, clearly, but they also need to be sterilized. And traditional autoclaving, which is high pressure, high temperature, uh, standard sterilization process within hospitals simply cannot be used for these connectors. They will damage the connectors. The connectors will just be destroyed. So ha doing that r means that these connectors have to be constantly replaced, which is just not operationally uh, efficient and effective. There's also this high isolation issue, which means that uh, when you have a camera inside of a body and the power required for that and a robotic console, which requires greater, much greater power, you can imagine that there needs to be some electrical standoff between these two systems. And by using plastic as a video uh, transport, you can get a high-speed signal, yet keep, keep the two systems isolated so there's no potential uh, pulse and, uh, between the, the larger system and the, the, the very fragile system inside of a body. So what we have coming out in the market is a connector that will be embedded inside of uh, plastic uh, that can easily be connected and can also easily be uh, sterilized using traditional uh, autoclaving, no longer requiring a going out for special sterilization where they need to get a special uh, tech to uh, use corrosive materials and very caustic materials to uh, sterilize the connector. Let's look at factory automation and automated test. So one of the uses we found for our connector, and this is actually deployed now in, uh, in, in, in some factories uh, with some devices that uh, we all know very well. Um, but the issue is, is, is an operational issue. In a traditional manufacturing assembly line today, you may have a pallet with a device under test, as you can see on the bottom there and it runs down the, 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 the conveyor belt, and there could be a fixture that is then placed on top, typically connected by pogo pins, and the devices are tested, uh, and, 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 and uh, then they move, continue to move down and probably are tested multiple times. Well, there's a huge problem with this. First of all, there's a very, very high reliability issue with pogo pins. Uh, our customers tell us one to 2% fallout from the pogo pins on, on the test fixtures, mainly because of just the inability to connect at the tolerances required for pogo pins. And so what, the, what, what people typically do is they buy very expensive actuators, which, which increases the cost, and that also increases the time because these actuators take more time to, to get to the tolerances required for the pogo pins. 
but still there's a, a major fallout um, at down to 1% from the pogo pins. And that's a big problem because, of course, you don't know whether it's the pogo pins that are failing or the DUT that's failing. As well, pogo pins cannot work reliably over one gigabit per second. Uh, the, the faster pogo pins are, 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 are asked to go, the more challenges there are with just the fact of two metal pieces touching each other, the, the tolerances are tighter, and they just fail at, at, at certain speeds. So alignment is a problem, cost of alignment is a problem, pogo pins are a, a problem, it takes more time, it takes more cost, and it reduces the flexibility of the, uh, of the, the factory floor. So with KISA and the way companies are implementing it, you now have this much more tolerant connection, has wider tolerances, it automatically connects and can automatically do the test. And with the speeds that we have, it can actually do much more than just test. It can do it very quickly, but you can also get flash uploads and, and all sorts of data uh, both ways uh, onto, the, onto the device and from the device. Now, where this becomes very critical is in devices like these, which are off-the-shelf IoT devices. And the problem with IoT devices, especially when it comes to test on the factory floor, and especially when these devices have to come back for diagnostics and debug, is that there is no data connector. There is no external data connector. Sometimes they may have a data connector internally for debug, and sometimes they don't. You have to probe the system. So this is where we implement products and we call these virtual connectors. And we call them virtual because the connector is on the outside but no one would ever know it exists and, it, and clearly it's not for consumers. So when these products are debugged, for example, that requires the removal of an external skin to gain access to the system and that even can change the characteristics of the product. Uh, and then there's another problem with debugging. There's a manual labor that's needed to perform the final checks and updates, which results in cost and human error. On the factory floor line, there's expensive alignment structures needed for the automation with the pogo pins. And when these products are tested on the factory floor line, you need someone to essentially plug these, these, these things into the debug connector. So what we do down at the bottom here, you can see is there's a small device that would be placed somewhere on the, on the product usually on the bottom, and as this product moves down, just like the pallet I showed previously, it can easily connect, uh, debug can be done, testing can be done, and then it can move on. One implementation that is out there using KISA has a robotic arm that, bring, that swings the DUT over the test fixture, connection is made, and then it swings it over to another test, so there are multiple tests that are done by one robotic arm using KISA as the connection. Finally, let me talk about automotive. It's also clearly an area where connectivity is becoming extremely important. Um, we know the increased number of sensors and cameras and LIDAR and, and radar and all sorts of uh, uh, sensors that are on, a, on, on, on modern automobiles. And of course, this will only uh, get greater and greater as we move towards more autonomous vehicles. And there, mechanical connectors and cables become a major issue. They can become a major issue because of reliability. Uh, this is now mission critical. And you also have these critical elements at the edge, which the means they're exposed to moisture and humidity and other environmental hazards. There's a weight issue. You can imagine with this just illustration here that cables are, uh, are extremely heavy uh, and that becomes a problem. Vibration is the key issue, moisture and dirt. And in this case of this LIDAR system over here, there's also these rotating data sensors. So again, you saw earlier how our technology can be used for rotational connections for high-speed data. You can imagine implement it into a LiDAR system and be able to be a, a seamless connection without any metal. So we, there are many implementations of our solid-state connectors in automotive applications to eliminate wires and to eliminate mechanical connectors. You've got a lot more tolerance for vibration. Uh, it improves reliability and manufacturability and enables data collection in rotational environments. We do have a system coming out in an automobile in uh, this 2019. Uh, this, we've been working on this for four years. Uh, we can't really talk too much about the specific application, but it's in this, in this area of, uh, of innovative ways of connecting devices in ways that they have not been connected before. 
One of the other things the automotive uh, people are looking at is how they can use our technology to connect the uh, displays. You saw the, the video wall, so imagine the same sort of technology being used uh, to go behind a, uh, a panel. In this case, you only need a couple of our devices because the speeds are not quite as, as, as fast. And you can easily just snap panels in to the dash and have an automatic uh, video connection. And the last one is an interesting one, uh, and that is massive data collection. So these cars, as we know, these new autos, especially ones that have LiDAR and, uh, and all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of sensors and cameras, are collecting uh, massive amounts of data every day. And it's just impossible to think about how you might download those via, via traditional Wi-Fi or traditional uh, LTE or, or, or over, over your, your, your traditional wireless connectivity methods. So what, what uh, Kisa is looking at is using the concept of multiple devices that may go inside of a, an electric um, charger. So with, during charging, you're not only charging the car, but you're also extracting the data uh, through this, this, uh, this device. And uh, it's a very quick, easy, efficient way of extracting large amounts of data from an automobile. And with that, I, uh, I want to thank you for uh, giving an introduction to Kisa. I hope uh, you appreciated it. We're happy to uh, have any inquiries. www.kisa.com is our uh, URL for our website, and you can always email us at info at kisa.com. And I want to thank uh, the folks at uh, Robotics and, and Information and Automation News for, for hosting us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. An excellent presentation it was too, actually. It's fascinating. Uh, can I ask a couple of questions, if you don't mind? We don't mind. Okay. Uh, either one of you can answer it. And um, it's not really to do with the deeper technical things, although I probably could ask uh, one or two questions about the technology. Uh, all of it was very interesting, very fascinating, particularly, I mean, I could pick out lots of, areas but the uh, idea of um, transferring data while you're charging the car sounds like a brilliant idea but uh, I wanted to ask your opinion about your own inventions and innovations you've got a lot of patents uh, which ones would you say are the most interesting possibly the most um, will have the most impact uh, maybe most commercial uh, basically I'm asking you to maybe uh, um, uh, I don't know what, what's the word, prioritize or, you know, pick out some of the ones that you think are going to be really uh, uh, good for you, either commercially or, or in other ways. Well, it's, uh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me take a stab at that. Uh, you know, as I said, our technology is so horizontal, and when we present to, let's say, an automotive manufacturer versus a mobile phone manufacturer, uh, they, they all see value, and they all see value for very different reasons. I think, uh, but, but to, to answer your question, um, I think on the industrial side, uh, on the non-consumer side, the key uh, aspect that people glom on to with our technology is the ruggedization, is the fact that they have uh, problems with vibration and heat and moisture and, and, and uh, um, all sorts of environmental factors, and that, that has a huge impact on product reliability. So, uh, so I think that's the number one thing, and it could come in a variety of ways uh, and, and, and ends up in a variety of ways. One example, which is obvious when you hear about it, is we have a design win in video uh, exploration underwater for oil and gas. Uh, their connectors are massive devices, uh, metal that is encased in all sorts of different uh, plastics and, and has all sorts of kind of ruggedization aspects to it, but it's extremely expensive. But you can imagine there uh, connecting our devices, um, putting them in plastic, connecting them, and then uh, putting them underwater, and, and, and you really have a, a solution. So I, I would say ruggedization generally, which means the connector is not exposed to the outside world for whatever reason, uh, water, heat, vibration, uh, moisture, dirt, dust, uh, and that's really the non-commercial applications. On the, uh, on the uh, no, I should say non-consumer non applications. On the consumer side, it really has more to do with product design. 
uh, and they, they all of a sudden the, you're not limited by a connector and you can do all sorts of different things that you, you, you would have a hard time doing with traditional connectors like that TV that is now a 70 inch 8K TV that's essentially a four millimeter in deep panel which could never be done with a traditional connector or a mobile phone coming out that has a dual screen uh, and, the, and the screen is connected with Kisa. So that allows new product design. But I wouldn't limit it just to the consumer side too, because on the uh, industrial side or the non-consumer side, you know, the LiDAR and the, and the slip ring concept of rotational connectors, we have a lot of interest there because uh, metal is, is difficult and we have uh, inquiries, for example, from windmills that are transmitting more and more data from the, uh, the edge to inside through a rotating connector. Uh, metal is a fundamental problem there. So uh, I think, uh, I think it's, it's a broad answer, but um, the ruggedization and the unusual properties of, of plastic uh, that allow people to do things that metal just is not so great at doing. Okay, thank you. Um, if I could ask you to maybe expand on that in a way, or the, you, you know, the question I asked uh, was uh, very specifically about your company and your product or products and, and applications thereof. Uh, but if I could ask you to sort of elaborate in the sense that, and uh, ask you to say, what, how do you see the future developing, the near future developing in the in in the areas that you've talked about, robotics uh, in factories and uh, automotive. What are the developments? I mean, you know, the, as you know, the, as you pointed out in your presentation, there's lots more sensors and cameras uh, being attached to um, robots, and there are other things happening to uh, cars and vehicles. Um, can you expand on that? And maybe look ahead a year or two. Uh, maybe beyond those things. Those things are happening now, but what are you, as a, obviously a technologist who knows these subjects very well, what are the other things that maybe people should watch out for in terms of uh, technologies and developments? Certainly connectivity is a key, so maybe you could you know, work your, uh, your um, uh, uh, products and innovations into, into your answer. Well, um, uh from our point of view, from from our let, let's talk about our product point of view. Of course, our the innovations that we look at are uh, solving solving connectivity between device to device in unusual ways. Of course, if you just want to place one device to another device, like the video wall, our, our solution is designed to do that. It's very easy to do that, and you can uh, you can read our data sheets and our application notes and do that. Um, however, uh, when you start looking at these these very um, very challenging uh, places where data needs to be uh, uh, transferred, and I, you know I, I talk about underwater, and I also I also should mention you know there are there are inquiries, and when we're working with people in let's say out of this world uh, applications, there you need to really really we really need to look at at all the core competencies and expertise we have in the properties of our technology that allow us to do things completely differently. So we do see. Um, Connectivity in harsh environments or with very complex environments like articulated joints and higher and higher speeds is, is, really, is really the focus of our company. Uh, knowing that whether it's robotics or automotive or, or the operating room, um, just like our, our personal devices, uh, connectivity is getting more and more critical and it's becoming more and more challenging. I mean, I, I know I'm answering in a broad way, but that's, that's clearly what we look at. And we look at how we can make our product as easy and ubiquitous as possible so that it can solve as many of these connectivity problems. And of course, on our product roadmap is, is the usual faster, cheaper, smaller. Um, and that's what we'll continue to do uh, because signals, signal, signal, signal speeds never go down. They always go up. Um, so I, I, I know I'm probably not answering the question the way you want. It really is, um, it really is we're looking for ubiquity uh, in our solution, um, not only on the physical connector portion of it, which is our solid state connector, but also in the way that we talked about, not in this presentation, of how those signals internally in the device get transmitted from the SOC to the connector. Um, and how, how you manage so many different protocols and so many different wires and pads and pins at the SOC level. It's a whole other presentation, but we see, we see the need for completely re-architecting the way IO works, both physically and, uh, and the way it's, it's delivered from an SOC.
Thank you very much. I just, uh, I mean, this just answer questions where you want, but I think that, that's it. And I think uh, just one more thing. I think at the very beginning you said uh, one or two numbers about the company, how many employees and things like that. Is there anything else you can share in terms of data? Because a lot of our readers are basically investors and, and people who have a general interest in lots of different types of companies. There may be activist invent, investors and interested you know, technologists themselves. They might have science backgrounds and technology backgrounds, uh, but they are interested in the numbers. They're always uh, thinking how, how commercial is this and how uh, is this company developing in the market? Can you, can you share a little bit about that? Not to, you know, uh, you're probably a private company, so you probably wouldn't share a hell of a lot, but is there anything that, that you can say that you can that would shed light on your company's uh, business and market position? Well, I can, uh, it depends on your definition of a little bit. So let me give you a very little bit. How about that? Uh, we are a private company, so we're not going to reveal uh, any sort of revenue numbers and so forth. But let me tell you that um, we've spent a long time developing this technology, and, um, and it is now in mass production. Um, the product is in mass production, been qualified, and so forth, all the things that you need to do to make a semiconductor work. And really, there are very few small semiconductor companies. It's a, it's a dying breed. So that's what's taken us to where we are now. And in 2019 is the year of products in the market. There's no question. All of those markets that I showed you will have products, representative products in the market. So it's mobile. We'll have a mobile phone out in the first half of this year. Uh, that 8K TV is going to be shown at CES, which is in January of, uh, of 2019. Uh, the video walls, there are four manufacturers of video walls coming out with products in 2019. Uh, robotic surgery system coming out, uh, auto, uh, autonomous vehicle system coming out using our technology, uh, and, a, and an edge, edge storage data center uh, coming out uh, in, also in 2019. So without revealing numbers, I will say that we are, we are at a very interesting and very exciting time where uh, our product finally comes to fruition in terms of being embedded um, in, and, and used in, in, in use cases and applications, some of which we identified eight years ago, some of which we never knew until we talked to people and they said, this is where we can use your technology. So it's an exciting time. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Kimberly. Well, I want to thank everybody for their time. And thank you, Steve and Roger, for taking the time to tell us about Kisa. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Send us an email at sales at roboticsandautomationnews.com to register for one of our many upcoming webinars. And if you'd like us to host your webinar, we have a range of options, including long-term lead generation packages and marketing campaigns. We look forward to hearing from you soon.